Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Frontier Scum. This is an acid western role playing game, or a game about wanted outlaws making their mark on the lost frontier by Carl Druid. This thing is published by Games Omnivorous, and right away you can see one of the cool things is the way that this is designed and bound. Uh, there is basically no spine on the side of this here. You can just see all of the raw signatures with the stitching right there, which seems a bit weird. It seems maybe kind of cheap, but really it's there for a very particular reason, which I like a lot. And that is this book lies totally flat. Because the spine does not taking up any uh, space, it's not you know forcing the book to stay open, Every spread is a completely flat page, which is really cool and extremely efficient in terms of running it for uh, any type of D&D-like game. As usual, I will put links in the description below where you can pick this up in PDF or print form if it is still in print, but if not, hopefully you can sign up to get notified when it comes back into print. Before we dig into Frontier Scum, though, I should point out that this month I am giving away a copy of Faults of Varn, which is a hardback science fantasy setting for old school d and I did a review of it recently, as well as 10 copies of The Waking of Willoughby Hall, and I'll be giving those away to people who are subscribed to the Questing Beast newsletter, which is totally free. Link is in the description below. All right, what's in Frontier Scum here? Here's our inside front page. We've got a quote from William Blake. It's designed by Carl Druid with a bunch of other people helping him. And we start out by looking at the setting itself. All the descriptions here paint very vivid pictures of these locations in this parallel universe fantasy western thing that it has going on. So for example, we've got Sunken Hill GC. Don't know what the GC stands for. It's probably supposed to sound like an American state, though it doesn't actually refer to uh, a real one. At Sunken Hill's acrid swamp, folk chain coffins shut, for something beneath this bone orchard causes corpse parts to bubble up from the ground like a bilious sludge. The first settlers buried their dead en masse, and at that original interment, the air grew foul and the earth loose and boggy. Sweltering heat dominates Sunken Hill, oppressive enough to blur vision and send trespassers stumbling into nearby wilds or this ravaged, upturned mire's hungering mud. Really draws you in there. I love how the book is scattered with advertisements, which all feel like they are in-world advertisements, because each page feels like it's almost like a flyer or a poster put up in a Western town. These little advertisements are not only a lot of fun and add a lot of flavor to the game, but you could also, in theory, use them as quest hooks or places that uh, players could visit if they want to explore a bit more. Other locations include Slag Gaff by the Sea, Dalliance, Fort Gullet, Sickwater Oasis, Alls Hallow Canyon, the Western Expanse, we have a map right here with the different regions and the major locations that you can visit. These uh, numbers in between are the number of days uh, on horse that it would take to get there. And if you are going on foot, then you would double that time and you would quarter it if you could get there by train. Next, we're gonna get into the actual mechanics and the character creation for Frontier Scum. But first, a quick shout out to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Into the AM, who have been a longtime supporter of the channel and who make really fantastic sci-fi and fantasy themed t-shirts. I'm wearing one of them right now. They are really comfortable, they last for a really long time, and they are quite affordable as well. Uh, they have deals over on their website where, for example, you can get three t-shirts in a bundle for around $60. And if you use my link in the description below, you can get 10% off of the entire web store. They're really great t-shirts. I wear them all the time. In fact, pretty much my whole wardrobe is now into the AM t-shirts. So I strongly recommend that you go check them out in the link below. All right, let's see how we make a character right here. So um, the earth, there's four basic stats here. The structure of this is very similar to, or at least it was inspired by uh, Morkborg, though it goes off in its own direction a little bit. You're gonna roll D4 minus four for each of your four abilities. So that's gonna give you anywhere from a plus four to a negative four. Uh, you have start with D6 hit points plus your grit. Uh, you get some traits. You're always wanted for something because you are an outlaw by default. You get backgrounds, you get skills, and you get some starting equipment right here. The random tables are a lot of fun for making all sorts of uh, weirdos that are going around this acid western. For example, you could be an outlaw with an artist soul and be set by fleas, or friends in high places and a groomed appearance. You're also wanted for things. You combine these two tables to get all sorts of weird crimes like uh, hired smuggling or attempted grave robbing. One clever thing is that the total reward is the total result multiplied by 10. So if you were just arrested for or wanted for accidental loitering, you're only gonna have like a $10 bounty. But if you if it was for unionized murder, then that's gonna be a much higher bounty. There's 12 different backgrounds here like Carcass Trapper or Discharge Deputy, Dr. Sands Diploma. Each of them gives you uh, two skills and some equipment from over here. Uh, these skills are not given specifically. You can actually make them up. It's a bit free form. So for example, it could be uh, a skill from the time that you were thrown into a busy street 
or uh, got hustled by another scum. So you can take that scenario and think of a skill that fits that and write it down. Basically, if your skill applies, you're going to get advantage on that roll. So roll two d20s and take the best one. There's also some bonus skills and bonus items. So for example, you could gain a skill when you fell into a river. Perhaps that means your skill is swim upstream or endure cold or crocodile wrestling. You know, you choose or make something up. You get a random horse generator because of course you have a random horse generator. Maybe your horse is hurricane lightning or goblin phantom or bloody carnage. Your horse also likes particular things like peace and quiet or taunting predators. There is a inventory system here because you're actually going to be tracking uh, what you are carrying. And I really like how the system works. You have a couple places where you can put stuff. You can put things in your pockets where you have 10 slots and those will have to be pretty small items like coins, bullets, can of beans, or things that are on your belt. You have three slots for that, like a revolver or a sawed off shotgun, things that are on your back, three slots there, but they can be larger, like a heavy fur coat or a repeater rifle. And then on your horse, you can fit a whole bunch more naturally. One neat rule is this hat rule. It reminds me of the rule, uh, shields shall be splintered, which you often see in OSR games where you can shatter your shield in order to ignore damage from one attack. This is basically the same thing, but it's your hat instead. When you would be hit by an attack, you can lose your hat instead. And then after the fight, you have to make a luck roll to see if it survived or not, or you may have to get a new hat. There's ability checks here. It's just a D20 roll. Add the positive or negative modifier from your ability score and try and hit a difficulty rating. Uh, you have ace in your sleeve. This can be tracked with actual ace cards if you want and allows you to do a re-roll. You gain an ace at the start of every session and um, they work on pretty much every, any roll that isn't a natural 20 or a natural one. Neat little rule here. Whenever someone rolls a natural one, everyone loses all of their aces, which I think is smart because that encourages people to use their aces regularly instead of trying to hoard them. One rule that I like quite a bit is that if you are shooting a gun and it's under fairly normal circumstances, you don't make a check to hit. You automatically hit enemies and you just straight up deal damage. So gunfights are going to be really fast and really deadly. You're only going to make checks if you're like trying to shoot a gun while you're in melee or if you're trying to shoot a target that's very hard to hit for some reason. In terms of damage, when you drop down to zero hit points, you might roll on one of these tables to see what happens to you. If you're taking lethal damage, like you got shot by a bullet, you look at the negative hit points that you've dropped below zero, and then subtract that from a d20 roll to see what happens here. You could be very lucky, like you got a second wind, and you heal actually a little bit and increase your maximum health. But it's quite possible that you are instantly dead, or you're going to die very slowly and bleed out on the ground. There's rules for hunting and foraging here, along with a big list of different types of game that you can try and track down, each of which has a little special ability that you might have to deal with if you want to play that out. For example, a crocodile has a death roll ability. Uh, DR16, sl uh, you slick, that means you're, you're going to roll your slick ability. Um, or the victim is grappled and takes D8 damage every turn as it drags you under the water and twists you around. There's lots of very short, terse write-ups for different types of NPCs you might encounter, anything from gamblers to bounty hunters to ranchers just that you know generally what the stats are going to be of your enemies. Now there's rules here for going on a bender, which is basically uh, carousing. And one thing I noticed about them is that they have some really fun random tables for what happens after you went carousing. Um, the only thing is that the way the rules are written right now, if all your characters have low luck or most of them have low, low luck, then generally you're going to be losing stuff and owing money every time you go carousing, which is, is really going to disincentivize people uh, from doing that. And they're only going to go carousing when they have high stats. Um, that makes things a little bit, I don't know. I wish things were more incentivized towards carousing just because it throws more wrenches in the works. And if players can predict ahead of time that things are probably going to go bad for them, they're just never going to do it. You might win something really great, like a saloon's owner forgot to lock their safe, a mistake they won't make twice. You might lose something really badly, like you wake up in the wilderness, miserable, hungover, and surrounded by approaching animals. You've had better mornings. Not really. Though in the worst case, you could start owing people money, like, I like this one, the Incorporated Bank. It's like this long um, string of legal text that just runs off the page because, of course, the contract goes on forever. And that's going to put you in even more debt and inspire perhaps more adventures as you have to work that debt off. Now that's pretty much all of the rules. The rest of the book is the Oregon Rail, where you are bound and uh, tied up on this train being sent to your deaths and you need to escape the train and perhaps perform a train robbery at the same time. Classic kind of adventure for a Western style role-playing game. And trains are just really great because there is a lot of kinetic energy there. You can climb along the top of the train, around the outside of it. You can fight your way up and down these uh, cars. Lots of great things that are a lot of potential there for player shenanigans and chaos, which is something I like. One thing that the book is doing is that it really doesn't want you to climb along the outside of the train though. So is that something I might uh, dial back a bit? For example, if you try and climb over the, the top of the train along the top, 
if there's a sudden movement and you make a bad roll, your character could just be killed. They fall off the train and get pulverized. That is um, a bit too steep of a penalty for me because I want my players to try weird stuff like that. So I might tone that down a bit. Uh, it is a little bit of a railroad. I mean, literally, in the sense you have to work your way up through the cars. So I would just give players a bit more options. The design of this adventure is really nice. Each of the different cars are drawn right here. And then down here, you can see the whole train and where you are on the train, right? You're at number one right here. There's 10 uh, cars that you can traverse. And each of the pages is just for another car. So it's very easy to read and to parse. You start out in the prison car with perhaps a random item that maybe you can use to break out, or you can try and trick the guards and steal one of the keys. And you start fighting your way up through the train, through this, um, the barracks car, which is full of guards, mess car where people are eating, cage car full of uh, wild animals, which of course you could unleash on the guards perhaps, or send them forward to help you out. There's a lab car here where a uh, evil scientist is conducting experiments on prisoners and mutating them into weird hybrid animals. And you can either join him and try and recapture these uh, mutants as they escape and pillage the rest of the train, or you can aid the mutants in taking over the train themselves. The doctor has these syringes of this kind of super serum that instantly heals any kind of injuries and can even bring you back from the brink of death. Uh, but using it connects you to a kind of hive mind where all the creatures, including all the mutants, are able to talk to each other psychically because they have this serum in them. The gun car has a full-on shootout going on that you can take part in, and you can get to the engine up front, which is full of this weird beating heart. It's an organic engine that is powering this thing. And this is the heart of the whole hive mind. Uh, if you destroy this and you have the serum in your body, then all the creatures that uh, have the serum in them, rather, are all going to die as this thing dies. So maybe you want to keep it alive. But regardless of what happens, you're going to probably get 10,000 silver as you break into the uh, safe at the very front of the train. And that's going to set you up for further adventures. There's a whole bunch of ideas right here. For example, you might obtain the deed to an old castle outside of Stubbshead County Fishing Village. It's a drafty, derelict, and full of hidden passages. But what you really want to know is who's rattling those chains at night. So you could have a little dungeon crawling adventure if that's what you want to do. If you want to take some time off during downtime and do some odd jobs or some opportunities, you can make a little bit of money at a time but not as much as getting bounties, for example. You might want to pursue Ooze uh, Sheepskin Clay Morrow, leader of the Cattle Snake Gang, wander for rustling countless heads of cattle, untold sheep, and innumerable horses. Some animals are rebranded and sold, but most seem to simply vanish without a trace. Feature a horse with two heads, hideout unknown, sometimes seen near All Hallows Canyon, and you got a reward from them. And the bonus is you get a two-headed horse. Some lists of loot for if you loot someone's house or go through their pockets, and even more if you want to go through tombs. And some weird relics if you want some uh, special magical artifacts. Anything from a wand card from ancient bone, or a soundless whistle that makes animals attack you, or six-sided dice that always roll a six on stone. The back page has references for all of the rules, so you can quickly summarize how the whole game works on two pages. That's very nice for getting people up to speed quickly. And uh, that is it for Frontier Scum. Um, I like the rules. The rules are very clean and straightforward. And I like the fact that it is very quick and deadly, especially with the rule that guns hit automatically. I think the design and the format of the book are extremely good. It's a lot of fun to read and a lot of fun to just hold in your hand. The main thing I would like to see more of are random tables for generating more of the world, for generating new types of adventures and scenarios, generating new locations and things like that, just so that you can have a bit of a longer campaign. A few more random tables to flesh out some of that stuff I think would be very welcome. Perhaps something similar to what we saw in Vaults of Varn, where you had generators for generating different types of camps and tombs and other miscellaneous locations. In any case, check the links in the description below if you want to get Frontier Scum for yourself. And remember to subscribe to the Questing Beast newsletter if you want to get in the running for Vaults of Varn and all of my future giveaways. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you next time.